Hello, Kirk. Again. Again. <laughs> again, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so we had a little echo problem to start uh, before we went live. And then we figured out the echo problem and we started the intro video and we're like, what? five seven minutes into our conversation excellent banter excellent <laughs> and then i realized wait a sec i forgot to hit the go live button <laughs> so the only reason i'm here is to go live and go off and uh here we go um so we're gonna do this all again um well maybe not but um yeah, so we're going to skip the pre, pre-conversation pre stuff banter and go right into the topic for today. What does it mean to be human? Um, this is something that touches philosophy and science, religion. What else does it touch? It, it pretty much touches anything that we're, that's relevant to us. For example what you understand yourself to be when you think of being a human being will radically affect your relationships. It'll affect your moral view on the world. It'll affect your view on politics. Uh, it'll, it'll affect how, how, uh, even let's say your sexuality, it'll affect actually, in fact, it'd be hard to figure out a way it does not affect us because it makes a huge difference. And here's why. It makes a massive difference <clears throat> if we are just an animal. And boy, I say just an animal, I mean, your body is all you are. That's You're just a bag of meat, but very intelligent. And that's it. If that's it, if you're just a body that responds to your environment and reacts and makes decisions, so-called decisions on your environment, that's one thing. But if you are more than a body, in fact, if you are an eternal soul from the Christian, from God's perspective, who dwells or interfaces within this physical world via a body, then everything changes in how you relate to other people. You're no longer just relating to them, for example, on a physical level, but on other levels that are much deeper, on a spiritual level, on a soul level. Um, when you see what's going on in the world, say Putin decides to invade Ukraine, this isn't just a matter of, let's say, one dog sees a piece of meat over there and decides to go over there and get that meat away from the other dog. No, there's a lot more beneath the surface. And to truly understand people, you need to understand what it is to be human. And this is something that deviates quite a bit from or our psychology today has really deviated from because... In psychology today, the idea of, a, of an actual soul, something non-physical that actually defines you, that it is independent of your body, survives death perhaps, um, depending on what people mean by a soul, that's not believed in, in secular psychology today. In secular psychology today, you are just a body. Now, sometimes they will talk about some properties they have, like we might have like the self-awareness, for example, might be what they call an emergent property. Now, whenever you see the phrase emergent property being used by an academic or a scientist, what that means is if is it's often used as a filler term for when you have no idea what you're talking about. Like <laughs> <laughs> you well, see this over here, you have no explanation for that. So you say that over there, that's an emergent property. We just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> yeah, and the problem need more is more science. Need more science is what. Yeah, I, except the problem is if you actually are a living eternal soul, then science is not going to help you very much because science only works with space, time, matter, and energy and the laws of physics. And if you are actually something that transcends that, or a major part of you is, uh, is transcends that, then that part that is above. Science is above space, time, matter, and energy. Does not have any mass or energy to it that actually is you. Science is not going to be very helpful. It's kind of like using a baseball bat to uh, go to a symphony and deciding on the ba using your baseball bat to decide which which uh, piece was the best one. It's totally the wrong tool. 
So before we really get into this, um, if you're watching and uh, you have questions or want to uh, engage with us, please go to the comments. Uh, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, uh, hit the bell if you want to be notified when we when we do these conversations and when uh, Kirk posts other videos. Uh, one went up uh, recently. Uh, maybe, Kirk, just share a little bit about the one that you put up yesterday. Yeah, that was um, actually that went up, uh, yeah, last night, I guess. Um, <clears throat> what it, it basically is 11 ways or 11 ideas or suggestions to build your child's faith to prepare your child to not only spiritually survive in our secular culture, but to actually flourish in our secular culture. And I write, I wrote that, or I did that video on the basis of a couple of seminars I've given on the topic recently, I've been asked to give. And um, <clears throat> the material from that seminar actually comes from having six kids. Uh, we've raised six children. They're all married with having their own kids now. And I look back on, um, what did we accidentally do right? <laughs> and what what did we not do right that I wish I'd done something better, you know? And from that wealth of information, both what we did right and what we wished we'd done or what we wished we'd done better, I there's 11 ideas came up here. Um, no, I could, each one of those ideas could be a episode itself, but basically yeah, that- it sounds like a, a, some sort of- manual to raising children that you've been producing as we go here. Yeah. Well, and that's just the spiritual aspect. I've been asked to speak a, a, a lot of times also on just raising kids. Like how do you teach them logic? For example, how do you bond with your children? Like there's so many things that could be talked about in this area, but speaking of a manual uh, with this video, I put up this on my channel. Now there is a link below where you can click and you can get the notes for it if you're more of a note reading person rather than a video watching person. So and you go, so. go and download that before Kirk uh, figures out he has extra time on his hands, writes a book and sells it. Uh, the very thought of writing a book just makes me, ah, uh, you know, one <laughs> screaming off in their opposite direction. I have a hard enough time writing an article. Forget about writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> That's, oh, um, all right, so now that commercial's out of the way a little bit, um, it does bring us back to um, the idea of what does it mean to be human? Because why yeah. would you put so much effort into raising children right? Re um, exactly. How do you help them understand their identity if you don't mm -hmm. know what humanity is? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a secular view of humanity. Uh, we uh, heard about that a little bit when we started talking about free will and watching um, some of the videos from uh, Sabine. 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 Um, uh, yes. So I always mess up her name. Yes. Yeah. Sabina, I think Sabina. it is. Sabina um, Yeah. So she had some ideas on free will uh, from a physics perspective that. Um, really defines what humanity is for for a lot of people um, or what they think it is. Um, as Christians, obviously, we have an idea of a soul um, that transcends the physical. What does the science say? Like, obviously, if this if um, psychiatrists have this emerging, um, what was it? Emergent, emerging, it's an emergent property, self awareness emergent property, you know, um, the mind, so to speak. Okay, so they, they they know that there's this thing, they just don't want to really admit where it comes from because yeah. it breaks down some of the ideas that um, they hold strongly to. Um, yeah. It's there's this uh, there's this assumption in today in the academic world today, at least in the Western world, that um, we have to explain everything. We're not allowed to use any. We're not allowed to use God or a Creator or anything like that to explain anything. And um, <clears throat> that is a bit of an extreme position to take. It's kind of like we made up a rule and we're not allowed to say any intelligent agent was was behind. Let's say making smartphones, computers, jet aircraft, cars. We're not allowed to, it, so it all has to come up with a natural explanation. And that's that would result in a pretty 
big pile of creative storytelling to, to explain how we got this just through natural processes. But nevertheless, that goes on in the academic world today. And sometimes you run into, no, it can be helpful in the sense that, you know, the way God has set up this world, he has uh, created laws of nature, which he talks about in the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, laws of nature that govern the way this world works. But we're, and so, yeah, we want to find, figure out how nature works. But on the other hand, there are things God has done that um, basically are supernatural. They, the laws of nature could not produce those. This is where science comes in, because science can be very helpful sometimes in eliminating options. So let's say we have this idea that um, the information of DNA just came about through natural processes. We quantify that information, which we can do through equations. We then run scenarios either in the lab or computationally. And what we're finding is that there is no chance whatsoever that you will get that degree of inf digital information encoded in the genomes of life anywhere in the universe over a period of any number of billions of years. No chance. The, it, the, it's just too small. So science can be helpful in eliminating an option, but if God actually programmed the human genome, then um, we got a problem because it's not going to be done in a scientific way. It's going to be created that information. In fact, that's a problem we have even with human beings. So when I worked as an engineer for a, a company that made aircraft engines, it all starts with concepts in people's heads and their minds. And there, we have not discovered how yet the brain can come, can do the things it does. Uh, there's, there, it seems to be a, what, what they might call a neural network. You can program the brain through responses and and it with the environment and so forth. But the central operating system, the, cent the central processor that's supposed to govern the processes going on in the brain, there isn't any. There is none. Uh, in fact, there's a Nobel Prize winner. His name escapes me at the, minute, at the moment. But he got the Nobel Prize for his work on the human brain. And his conclusion was, is there... Uh, there got to be something else behind the brain because the brain does not explain. The, the brain is just too simple. It's just too rudimentary to be able to do the things that we do. There has to be something more powerful behind it, some sort of central processing system with its own operating system that presides over the brain, the physical brain. But I, I'm sort of digressing here. I haven't even defined what I'm talking about. Let's say we, we know what a human is from a... Uh, uh, Let's define before we get into what our our definition of human is. Why don't we talk about what? Why is it important to really define it? Why is it really important to understand? Yeah. Well, let's just take a couple of examples. Mental health, for example. Um, no, this doesn't solve all mental health challenges that people have because uh, sometimes, a lot of times, that mental health, those mental health challenges, are due to literal, clinical, genetic, or physiological processes going on that, that medicine can help with. There's another kind of um, mental health challenge that we can face, and that's where we all find ourselves um, affected by, let's say, what's going on in the world today. And, it's, and we can be happy about it, or we can be not so happy. And I think when I read what the I read the surveys and the studies being done now, especially amongst university students, they're not doing well. The majority of university students today, at least in my country, Canada, are at least two-thirds are experiencing mental health challenges and they're not going in the right direction. So, for example, how does it matter? What does it do? So um, if you think you're just an animal, like you're just a body, it's just a physical world here. And th th it basically, it follows from that, that this life is all you have. And when you die, it's the worst thing ever. It's, it's the end of any more opportunities to have good times, be happy, and so forth. So if you find yourself in this life, seeing that it's not going so well, the markets are going downhill. We've got the threat. Of, we've got actual war in Europe. We've got just in the news this morning, increasing threats of war in the East with 
with uh, China and Taiwan, China wanting to invade Taiwan and in their own special military operation. We've got the threat of war in the east. We've got actual war in the in the west, or the east front up to Canada. It's the, it's the opposite, but that doesn't make us feel good. And then you see, you know, the, the COVID has been enormously damaging to the human psyche. Not so much the COVID disease itself. Let's say. It's more the lockdowns that have occurred, people having to isolate from their friends and the family, the reduced social activity. That's been enormously. So if you look around and you see this life is all I have and I'm kind of getting swindled here. There's it's not looking good. I'm not having a good time. It's kind of like when you're going on a when you pay money to go on a, a, a ride at a, an amusement park and, it, you know, it only lasts this long and. Like 50% of that is just loading people and maybe they're having a little bit of problem and you stop or whatever. You feel that you're getting swindled here and it doesn't do you very much good. And that's what's happening with a lot of people today. If this life is all there is and you are just a body. Another way it affects us is if we're just a body, um, then it really does affect our moral, our moral perspective on the world in a number of different areas. For example, um, it's a lot easier to end a biological life than to end a human being's life who is more than just a body. They have a soul and a spirit. There's something about, you know, we, we take our animals, no matter how much we love them, we'll take them to the veterinarian, for example, when they are getting old and they can't make it anymore and their quality of life is going down and we put them down. And so it changes our perspective on murder, for example. Murder. Murder is, um, is not as bad if we're just a body. If we're just a body. It, well, it's bad for the person that gets murdered because this was all they had. But, but, but I'm not even seeing that as being um, real for people because their, their view is, well, their, their life wasn't great anyway so it's better to put them out of their misery yeah well that's and there's it works a couple of different ways because uh let's say for the end of life i've often thought what happens if i'm in a care home towards the end of my life physically i'm a wreck from old age my body is just not working well anymore at all i can't do anything anymore other than maybe feed myself hopefully and maybe go to the bathroom i hope so what's the point in continuing my existence? Now, if you are just a body, there really is no point when your quality of physical life goes downhill that far. But from my perspective, I actually am an eternal soul, a living eternal soul. And this whole point of this life is to prepare for eternity and to meet God. So I have often thought if I ever wind up in that predicament in the care home, because I've spent quite a bit of time in senior care homes. If I ever am one of those people someday, the last, uh, all the other things, I have a pretty clear agenda. My calendar will be pretty free. There's no responsibilities I have to carry out anymore. The only thing left to me would be to spend those last months, maybe a year or two, preparing for eternity. In prayer, thinking about God, maybe listening to the Bible, making sure that I am ready for the final step. But if I'm, if I'm not an eternal soul, if I'm just a body, then pull the plug once my quality of life gets down so low. And uh, even how we treat other people, we're just treating, you know, if we see other people as much more than just a body. C.S. Lewis put it well. He says, um, the people that we meet today, the dullest person you might meet today, will someday be in eternity either a creature that you'd be, find almost impossible not to fall down and worship when you see yourself in the, that person in the full eternal magnitudes or a creature that you would even only see in your worst nightmare or in a horror movie, one of those two destinies. And But if you don't see it that way, if you just see a, a dull person walking down the street, dull in your, from your perspective, you don't value that person much. In fact, the term of human value then becomes very subjective. I value people because they are created in the image and likeness of God. They are God-like. There's a God-likeness about human beings. And I don't care how, what sort of genetic challenges they may have. I don't care what sort of crimes they may have committed. 
uh, or how awful they are as a neighbor to live beside. And by the way, my neighbors are great, just in case they ever listen to this podcast. But I don't care about that because there's something far greater than that, and I value them. But if they're just an animal, if people are just animals, then the only, what value should I put? It's only what they can do for me, basically. And I know that people tend to say, oh, no, we, we need to value people because they're this or that or the other thing, but they come from a secular perspective. They need to really think. If you're saying that, you need to really think on why you're saying that because I suggest to you that intuitively you know we're not just a bag of meat. You know we're not just a highly, highly developed animal. You sense that there's something far more to a human being than just a body. So, so that's why it's important to know what is a human. What is a human? Yeah, um, that's the central uh, so question. So what, what does science say is a human? What does philosophy say is a human? Is, is there a definition that, that the world agrees on outside of what Christianity says? Like what, what are different people saying out there that, that, that is a human? Well, the trend now in today's culture, and you see it a lot, is, um, is that uh, we're, we are a, we're a species of animal. That's the trend. We're a species of animal. And the implication there is that's all we are. We are an animal, and we need to then treat our cousins, i.e. the other animals, and our relatives, i.e. the other animals, um, much better than we have. And so I see that often that approach being used in, say, in environmental videos and articles and stuff. But the why? I, I don't under, this is what I don't understand, is if all we are is another animal and we're at the top of the food chain in because we have more control over the food chain, why is it important to treat other animals with respect? Like, well, I don't, I don't really see in nature a whole lot of respect happening between two levels of the food chain. No, no, there's, it's very different in nature. And this is what, and the question you asked Sheldon is actually a very important one because it, to start thinking about the why should we treat whatever better uh, actually opens up a can of worms or a huge philosophical issue. And that is that what I observe is that people cannot live People cannot live with the idea that they are just a bag of meat. They are a material chunk of tissue. And everything they think, do, and say has been determined from physics and chemistry from the origin of the universe. They cannot live that way. And there's a reason why I think they cannot is because it's false. We are not just a body. We actually have an, a soul. In fact, we not only have a soul, um, when you look at the what God said describes us. There's a nice verse in um, in the New Testament part of the Bible, First uh, Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty three, and it basically states that uh, it talks about that we're created in three parts. There's a complete human being has three parts, and so in, it says God made us in His own image and His own likeness. When you look at that, what does it mean? It means that there we're a model of God. We're not God. We're just an image of God or a model. And God is a triune being. There are three persons, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we look at a human being, you know, you see that a complete, the only place in the Bible where it's really explicitly stated as to what a complete human being is, is that verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. But once you understand that verse and a lot of things, it's kind of Rosetta Stone and a lot of other passages in the Bible. But in there it says body, soul, and spirit. And uh, no, there's a lot of arguments. What's the, what, what's the difference between soul and spirit? And another passage in the Bible says that the word of the Bible, the word of God, can distinguish between the two, which implies that it's not an easy thing. But the implication is, is that you are first and foremost an eternal, non-physical eternal soul who dwells within a physical body in this world. And so when the Bible talks about a body, it always uses terms like, a tent that you live in or a jar of clay or a vessel within which you live in or a garment. Um, 
different different terms that all describe the body as something within which you dwell. It's part of you. It's a critical part of you and an important part of you, but it's not the whole you. The primary you, so to speak, is is a living, eternal, non-physical entity being, non-physical being. And so in the Bible, when it says that he urges us to present our bodies to Christ as a living living sacrifice. Who is the person doing the presenting? So if the body is getting presented to God, who is doing the presenting? And once again, we come back to this idea that it is you. You as a non-physical, eternal soul is actually a steward of another part, important part of you, key part of you, and is your body. And it's up to you to decide or God has given us the freedom to decide how we use that body. We can either use it as a, as a dedicated to God to be pure or, or um, so that God can, we, we can realize our full potential that God has created, or we can just use it for our own pleasures. And for our culture today, it's used more for our own pleasures, but that's because we don't really in our culture teach that you are an eternal soul and there's much more to life than just what your bodily functions are. Okay, so um, the soul, this uh, eternal being that we are, is is that human um, in that without the body, it's still in existence? Yeah. So uh, eternally, that survives the body goes away w where does the mind fit in here yeah well f a christian philosophers generally tend to see the mind as distinct from the brain now there's a lot of discussion a lot of controversy here, but bottom line is and this is my view i can i can give you my view at least sure. and my view is held by various philosophers but there you have a brain which is a physical thing works on chemistry and physics but it doesn't it's just a neural network to kind of function in this world it's programmed and so forth but the mind is actually the soul okay it, whether so it's those are the same there's, same there's thing. no difference between the two things okay. well um i would say that the mind is entirely included in the soul but there might actually be more to the soul than just the mind okay although i'm not sure it talks about, about renewing the mind yeah is that that's not the brain that's this the i think the renewing of the mind uh, that's a very good question renewing means um reprogramming it or refreshing it or cleaning it up is that this is another very important part of what it means to be human that i have not mentioned yet but there's the I'm natural sorry, I'm skipping you. ahead yeah there's the natural you uh it's the way you were born it's the natural person and it's not, we're not just talking about your body here. It's, we're, let's call it human nature, okay? And God says that the natural way you are, referring to your human nature here, not your body, but your natural desires, your natural things you're oriented to, the things that you would naturally be interested in, the way you would naturally respond to people, especially if they cut you off in traffic, that sort of thing. God describes that as the natural person. And he says it's being corrupted. It's dead. It's actually the words, terms he uses that uh, you would describe, used to describe a corpse that has died and it's now in a state of decomposition. And he says the natural way we are as human beings is in a state of decomposition. But that natural way we are is still, still here with us in this life. Then when we put our faith in Christ, there's a thing that Jesus described as a kind of a spiritual rebirth. There's, some, there's something new. You, there's a new you. It's literally a new self or a new you that now exists. So you might even say there might be, in some sense, four parts, the body, soul, spirit, and then the old nature, which God says you have to set that aside. He never intended us to end he tended this life to be a refining process, a learning process, a process like climbing a, a, a path that goes higher up into beautiful mountains. 
He never intended us to just celebrate the way we were naturally are right now and never change from that. No, we can't change the old nature. He didn't say, there's no way. He didn't say, I'd like you to change the old nature. I want you to just set it aside. So the mind, renewing the mind means is that the way we think is constantly, we're getting inputs from the world. And a lot of that input is not necessarily good. And so the renewal, and it's shaping the way we think. And so to renew the mind means we're being literally, whether you like it or not, you are being programmed by our culture every day. I am, we all are. If we live in it, we're being programmed by it. Subtly, slowly, we're not even aware of it. And this is not going in the right direction. So when God says, I want you to renew your mind, he is stating that there's part of you that needs, that's becoming defiled by this world, corrupted. And you you need God for that because you, you can't, it's kind of like asking the fox to guard the chickens. You can't clean up your own mind because you're the one doing it. And you are, you, your thinking is contaminated by the culture of the world. The mind allows you to think independently of the culture. Okay. So the mind, the mind is sort of the, um, the eternal, uh, let's call it the soul then. So the soul, uh, slash mind is is the eternal part it, the goal is that it lives in eternity with jesus now i i believe we get a new body if uh, mm. if i'm reading scripture right yeah. um what's the spirit in this case well that's a little harder to nail down i know that in some places the bible states that you're expected to control your spirit too for example he says that uh, god says that a a man who fails to control his own spirit is like a city without walls like so uh, when i read about this and and the interesting thing is is that that often sometimes the, the word the ancient greek words for soul and spirit are used interchangeably so some people would argue that Actually, the same thing then, but no. You will note that often in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, sometimes those persons are used inter- interchangeably as well. Because at the, we're not talking three gods here, we're talking one. And same with a human being, we're not talking, if I have a body, soul, and spirit, we're not talking about three Kirks. We're just talking about one Kirk, but he has three parts to him that are all fundamental, critical, and vital. So the mind uh, might, like the way we use the word mind needs to be, philosophers would, would have a long talk about that. Because there's, a, there's the mind, the pure mind, which is your soul, which if you have eternal life, exists forever. But there is the extension of that, your thoughts, the things that influence you, the information you're getting from the world. And some of that information is pretty bad. And that can pollute the mind. Um, it doesn't, you know, it could be online porn would be the obvious example, but, and people often think about that, but there's a ton of other things like just watching violent stuff on YouTube, for example, that pollutes the mind. Um, like, uh, oh, road rage, YouTube road rage videos, for example, I don't watch those because watching one person hate another, which is pretty much what happens in road rage. Hatred is not a thing I would voluntarily want to input into my mind. And, but yet we can't help but get, we live in the world here. We see the news. We see uh, on my smartphone, I get the news. I check it several times a day. It does affect you. And so it does cor- pollute. It does defile the mind. You're not a pure soul anymore. This is why God says you, it's so important to uh, renew your mind. And only he can do that by his own spirit. The Holy Spirit who dwells within the Christian, the, the third person of the Trinity, can actually live within your body. So your body, he's saying that's why you want to keep it pure and holy, because it's actually a temple of God. God dwells within the person who has experienced spiritual rebirth by putting their faith in Christ. But the Holy, like what Christians would term the Holy Spirit or old school Holy Ghost, that's different than the spirit like my spirit yes exactly very much so yeah your spirit is a human spirit you have a human soul and you're you are a human soul you have a human body and you have a human spirit and you as a as a human soul are expected by god to 
control your body and to control your spirit. It's kind of like a speedboat. Uh, remember years ago when I was kind of new at blasting off across unknown waters with a speedboat, putting a throttle right to the max, thundering across, just enjoying the scenery. And then one, one, the, one of the first times out, seeing massive boulders just right underwater all around me. Of course, I pulled the throttle back instantly, but I was in control of the boat. If I had not been in control of that boat and just put the hammer down, let her rip and just set back and enjoy the sun and let the boat go where it wants, it would get destroyed. There, there's no way. It, sooner or later, it hit a reef or a rock outcrop or the shore, and that would be it. And the same with your body. It is so important that you control your body because it's like a high-performance speedboat. Now, it might not feel very high performance. And actually, in my case, it feels less high performance with every year. I'm a leaky canoe <laughs> right now, Kirk. I'm a leaky canoe. <laughs> yeah, a leaky canoe. And it, it, even the finish on the outside isn't looking so great anywhere for me. It's hit um, some boulders. Yeah, it's well, we all hit boulders. That's one thing we do in this life. But um, the thing is, though, is that it, it is something of great value. God probably values our bodies more than we do ourselves. For the amount of time he spends saying, look, you need to you need to value your body. You need to control the body. In fact, another interesting one, uh, it comes, um, there's another quote. And what he, he talked about the word value, like humans don't tend to value their bodies the way they actually ought to. They put, they all, I mean, a lot of them value their bodies, of course, in you know, somebody lays hands on another person's body, you know, they get into big trouble. But um, how do they value their own body? That's the bigger question. How do you value your own body? And what do you do with your body that is, um, is productive or not? And so God says, for example, he says, flee uh, fleshly lust. That is the natural impulses of your body that go above and beyond where they're supposed to go. He says, which wage war against the soul. So basically you are a living eternal soul and you have to value and control your body, not let your body's impulse control you. And in our culture today, it's completely lost that war. And a big step is not even believing you have a soul or you are a soul. <laughs> so if you toss that out, you've tossed out what's central to being a human. You have dehumanized yourself the moment you conclude I have no soul. That is the single largest step in the dehumanization of humanity that you could take is abandoning belief in the soul and just living according to uh, like as a body that responds and reacts to your environment and to what it wants and so forth. It's kind of like taking that high performance speedboat and uh, jumping out of the boat, putting the throttle down first and then saying, I don't exist, jumping out of the boat. And that's a great speedboat, but it's going to destroy itself. And God's most first and foremost interested in how he does not want you to destroy yourself, even more so than you, because you may not have an idea how you can destroy yourself, but God does. As so why, but why, why does God care so much about what we do with our bodies? Yeah. Well, because, and again, you're getting my perspective as a Christian philosopher here. The whole point, but it's not just my perspective as a Christian philosopher. Plato, actually, the, the character Socrates in Plato's writings, uh, had, there's a beautiful quote. I think it's Art of the Phaedo, if I recall correctly. That was, Plato has a series of dialogues, and I think it's the Phaedo. But he says something like this, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have it memorized word for word, but it's if, if, this, if the soul is the only thing, is the thing that survives this mortal life, then the whole point of this mortal life should be preparing the soul for the hereafter. And so this is why it's so important that um, we... Now you, you, how did you phrase your question again, Sheldon? Why does God care what we do with our bodies? Yes, why does God care? It's so important that you learn how to... Keep your body pure in the sight of God. You can't keep it like clean as far as never having a shower goes, but 
the body, but more importantly, that verse that the, the bodily desires wage war against the soul, what that verse tells us is that if the soul loses that battle and you basically just do as your bodily desires you know, lead you to do, you as a human being have lost the battle, the central battle in what it means to be human, number one. Number two, there's no way you can prepare for eternity. I mean, your whole, the whole purpose of this life is to prepare to meet God. And that purpose has just been annihilated when the soul loses the war with the body and that the body now dominates you in what you do with anything. I mean, it could be your sexuality. It could be how you react when somebody cuts you off in traffic uh, as uh, the road rage videos that I never watch, but I've seen them advertised on YouTube. Um, I, I find personally uh, Traffic is a very good way to test to see how well you're doing. <laughs> I mean, we get lots of opportunity here in Southern Ontario, for which I'm not thankful, but you get lots of opportunity to see how does the, how do, and, and when I say body, it's, we're talking adrenaline here, adrenaline. So adrenaline can really, you need to control yourself in adrenaline rushes. I remember years ago as part of the karate club at the University of Manitoba, you absolutely had to control your body and you could never ever let your adrenaline get away on you if that ever happened and it never did happen but the what i picked up from the instructor is that you would be in deep trouble the instructor himself might decide to um use you as an example on how to do some some moves some correct <laughs> as a demonstration there was a little bit of pain involved you I'm would sure. be experiencing pain you'd probably be ejected from the class now if a karate instructor himself expects us to be able to control our own and these are pretty strong. You mean adrenaline rush is pretty strong. Um, you see some a bad call by the ref, and you may have experienced this, Sheldon, having been a ref yourself. You can see how the audience reacts to a bad call or to something you just didn't see. And I haven't coached kids soccer for many years and rep soccer. Um, you know, there's this instant rage, just this instant bodily. There was one or two times uh, I did not wasn't going to start swinging because I was in the stands, but I could see some parents were this close to going out on the field and beating on the ref or beating on the parents from the other team. It's it's so bottom line is this is why is it so important to God what we do with our bodies is that because if you want to mature, if you want to be reach the full potential as a human being, you as an eternal soul need to learn how to control your body and your spirit and marshal those together so you can achieve your maximum potential God has created you to achieve. And this is another reason. You will never achieve your maximum potential in this life if you are being, if your body wins that war against the soul, against you. You must bring your body into line in every way so, so humanity is created with a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, we're created with a soul. We're created uh, with a mind as part of the soul. From what I understand, you're saying uh, there's a spirit involved, and then there's the body. Um, when I hear the word identity, it is something that oh, I, have, I have three teenage girls. Mm -hmm. if, if they don't have a grasp of what their identity is, they will often struggle with mental illness. They will struggle with um, joy in their life. They will struggle with, in a lot of things. And I, from what I understand, that's how gangs um, are able to recruit. It gives people an identity. Um, it's why so many people are um, looking for boyfriends, girlfriends, yeah. They're looking for somebody to love them, but that's also an identity issue. Um, as as we're as humans are created, and when when we're able to answer the question, "What is humans? What what are we?" How how would you say you you define that when when you think of the word identity? Yeah. Oh, that's such a profound and important question um, because I have found 
as a person, I'll, I'll tell you my identity and then I'll sort of say, you know, how that affects if I didn't have that. But my identity is first and foremost, well, identity is inseparable almost pretty much from uh, value and significance. It's very closely related to value and significance. So what makes you valuable as a human being? What makes you significant as a human being? And for me, what makes me valuable as a human being is not any value I put on myself because I could be pretty hard on myself uh, when, because I let myself down. There's things I would like to do and accomplish and there's a certain level I'd like to achieve. It could be something as simple as what kind of mark you want to get on an exam or what kind of impression you would like to make with some people or what kind of influence you like, and you just fall short of that. So my identity is first and foremost knowing that uh, I'm loved by God, and I am loved by God. Jesus says that he wants people to know, he wants humanity to know that those who have been spiritually reborn, who have accepted his gift of eternal life and forgiveness for all the things we've messed up in, he says he wants the world to know that those pe those individuals are loved as an in each individual as the father has loved the son. In other words, there is no, you can't even quantify such love. And that's what gives a human being significance and value. So I, I have a, I mean, I've given lots of lectures in universities all over the place and there's people and, and been engaged and continue to be engaged online in lots of discussion groups. And because I'm a Christian philosopher and a Christian who is also a scientist, I get a lot of people who just laugh at me and just mock at me and just, you know, call me an idiot or, you know, all, and so on and so forth. But that really has nothing to do with my significance and value. And I know that what makes me valuable is that I am loved by God. And so people all over the world, the whole world could laugh at me and think I'm dirt and actually end up killing me for, for that matter, that they value me so little that they end up just killing me and throw my body in a ditch. That to me has no effect on my significance and value. And this is why I think it's so important to realize we are an eternal soul who've been created to mesh with God in the highest kind of relationship possible, which is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, because God already loves us with the highest unquantifiable magnitude of love possible. Now, there's other things that it does for me. It affects, you know, how I interact with people. Now, that the purpose of, of our existence is not the, the mission in life. The mission in life is to prepare to meet God and prepare for eternity. That's the mission we need to, that's the job we have. The other thing, as far as identity goes, is my identity is not in how much money I have. It's not in how good I look because... As you age, I mean, that just goes out the window. It's not in, um, you know, my sexuality. Like, I know that three seconds after I die, I'll be stripped of this body. I will no longer, probably what, what Jesus said, but he says we'll be like the angels. It's, it's not likely there's going to be any sex in heaven. I mean, we won't even have the equipment to engage in that. And, you know, I have no, I am, I'm actually quite happy to hear that because in our culture today, it just seems so obsessed with that, which is a thing of the body. And if you're just a body, actually, it makes good sense. Because from a Darwinian perspective, the, the highest purpose in life is to pass your genes on. So anything that restrains that needs to be set aside. But that's not the purpose in life. That dehumanizes a person to just an animal that passes on its genes a higher purpose is to know we've been created to interface with a being who is the origin of every good thing given and every perfect gift. And that changes everything. So my identity is no longer, you know, anything that our typical culture uses today to be identity. My significance is God. So without that, without that, if you're just a body, you have all of a sudden the great the thing that gives you the greatest value and significance is gone. Now it becomes you know, how wealthy you are, what kind of power you have in this world, your physical appearance. And it's just astonishing to see today um, how many people like just pose, uh, post on Instagram pictures of their face looking this way, smiling as if, you know, I need to see this. I, I don't really need to see this. Your face, 
fine. Like, I don't need, uh, I'm, when I see something like that, I feel sad. I actually grieve for the person because they need to realize they are so much more than just a face or just a body or just what kind of material wealth they have. Like Instagram, there's people, there's, there's like whole threads of, of, of exotic cars where they have their Ferraris and Lamborghinis and they dress and this is their life. This is what gives them identity is their wealth and the kind of car they drive. That is so, it's all going to be taken from us. You can't keep that forever. And if you are in a living eternal soul, that changes what you are. You are so much more than just a body or just a person who's wealthy for 70 years or just a pretty face or just a person with a lot of power, which will be taken. It'd be interesting to watch Putin because Putin is a classic, classic power person, narcissist, um, egomaniac. I better quit. <laughs> You're giving him an identity, Kirk. Um, <laughs> and I apologize for that, actually, you know, because God says we really need to see people as they really are and as they really are. And I know this is hard for people for, if for people to accept, but God actually values Putin. He, he has a living, eternal soul. And more importantly, there may be people watching this that have a very low estimation of their self have no reason even they might think to continue living. You have a reason. You are a living eternal soul and you need to fix your eyes on what you're on preparing to meet God in eternity because he is the origin of every good thing given. And But he does say this life is, is going to be hard and for a lot of people, it is brutal. To say if you suffer with chronic depression and I have friends who do, mm -hmm. that is hard, hard. Um, but you have to fix your eyes that this is not everything there is. There is a much greater morning that's coming in the future. You as a human being are living eternal soul, and someday you will be freed of this mortal body. And a lot of times, and I speak specifically of clinical depression, you'll be free of that, but only at the right time when you're ready for eternity. Leave that decision in the hands of God, mm -hmm. because there is preparation now for eternity in whatever difficult circumstances we are faced with. So I have a friend who's in chronic, serious spinal pain because she was a figure skater in her younger days and just wrecked her spine. Painkillers out the ears. Day to day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I don't know how a person can live like that. But at the same time, it does seem that um, if you know who you are and that God loves you and that you are a living eternal soul, it, it does help. And, and, she, you, I know and you have a purpose. You have a purpose. And there is a purpose for what you're going through in this life. Because God says there is a, there is a eternal reward for how we've gone through the refining fire of this life. And he often talks about it as a refining fire, not pleasant. But it's all for an amazing eternity that he says we can't even understand or wrap our minds around. Mm -hmm. So it makes a bottom line makes a massive difference whether you are you in what it means to be human, what you realize it is. A, tri a tripart being created in the image and likeness of God, who first and foremost is an eternal soul, or abandon that idea and just crawl through life thinking you're just a body and you better get what you can before the quality of life goes down. So uh, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you very much, Kirk, for um, going through this. I, I learned a bit. Um, I would love to hear from our audience as you've been um, watching this. Uh, what did you think? Um, did did we do a good job of explaining what humans are? Um, if you disagree with us or we think you think we missed something, please tell us. Uh, we don't want to uh, forget things and uh, we would love to continue this discussion. Um, and if you have ideas for what you'd uh, like to hear from us next time, um, that would be awesome too. feel free to drop those in the comments 
or in the chat or at kirkdurston.com. Check out the links that are posted uh, below this in the description uh, for some more information on uh, what does it mean to be human. All right, Kirk. Thanks so much. Bye for now. See you next week. Bye. We'll try and be on time next time. Yeah. <laughs>